All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Laura Walker McDonald, um, and I'm delighted to be uh, hosting this launch today um, of the public release of OCHA's predictive model for COVID-19 spread and mitigation. Um, we have a really exciting agenda for you this morning. Um, before I run through that, I just want to mention that this session is being recorded and that OCHA will be sharing the video subsequently. So for those who are asking, um, the answer to will the presentation be shared is yes. Um, you will see that you have a Q&A function, which you're welcome to use throughout the presentations. Um, we'll be starting with um, a, a bit of um, humanitarian and data and innovation context, and then we'll move to um, a technical overview of the model itself, how it works, um, and how to use it. And then we'll have um, a discussion on, about the model, why the model came to be, how it's being used and how it might be used in the future. Um, we will have plenty of time during that latter part of the session for questions um, and answers. Um, and so you are most welcome to use the Q&A function throughout the session and the OCHA team are standing by to get your questions um, and we'll be putting them to the panelists later on in the event. Um, just to let you know who I am, um, I have started my career in the humanitarian sector. I currently work for the Digital Impact Alliance, which is a multi-donor initiative hosted by the UN Foundation. And we work to um, accelerate the progress of digital transformation in countries, focusing mostly on Africa, but also working globally on the digital ecosystem. A uh, longtime fan of the OCHA Data Center, and I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, I'm going to open by welcoming Rain Paulson, who is the Acting Director of the Coordination Division for UN OCHA. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about him. Welcome, Rain. Um, so in that role, um, you manage OCHA's inter-organizational services, assessment, planning and monitoring, and the emergency su response support branch. You have more than 20 years of experience in humanitarian assistance and development in a variety of leadership, policy and operational functions for NGOs and within the UN system. Um, you've served as a board member and officer of the board for the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership and have held world uh, leadership positions with World Vision International. Uh, your first assignment, I believe, was as a humanitarian advisor in Rwanda. Um, and your first field-based assignment was in Haiti, working on Food for Peace funded activities. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us and I'll let you take it from here. Laura, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Guests from around the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be able to welcome you to this virtual event, uh, marking the public release of OCHA's predictive model for the spread and mitigation of COVID-19 in countries with uh, humanitarian crises. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, is charged with ensuring that humanitarian organizations have the uh, have the information and the resources they need to deliver vital assistance. As the director of OCHA's coordination division, I lead a team of dedicated humanitarians who work to assess needs, agree on common priorities, and develop common strategies to respond to emergencies. In late 2019, the humanitarian system projected that 168 million people in 23, uh, 25 countries sorry, would need humanitarian assistance in 2020. And we estimated that the cost of this humanitarian assistance would be approximately 30 billion US dollars. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a devastating impact on people around the world and especially on those already vulnerable. We now believe that more than 400 million people require humanitarian assistance, a staggering number that is hard to grasp in terms of the everyday impact on people's lives. Global humanitarian funding requirements have risen to a record 40 billion US dollars, with only 35% of that received so far this year. More than 43 million people worldwide have now been infected with COVID-19, and 1 million people have died. The enormity of the secondary consequences of the pandemic is also becoming apparent. Uh, we're seeing increasing hunger, malnutrition around the world with the World Food Program saying that 265 million people may be on the brink of starvation by the end of this year. Health and education systems are under strain, leading to a rise in preventable diseases and children dropping out of school. Women and girls are facing unprecedented levels of gender-based violence. The contraction of economies is undoing hard-won development gains and extreme 
poverty is set to rise for the first time in three decades. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought into stark focus the need for data and the value of models to inform response strategies. As the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mark Lowcock has said, one of the biggest opportunities we have is to try to use data and especially the tools of predictive analytics to get ahead, to be more anticipatory, to predict what is about to happen and to trigger the response earlier. We find ourselves in a time when anticipatory action is no longer an abstract idea. It is something that people are actively doing by staying at home or by increasing the number of hospital beds in order to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. Since March this year, OCHA has been working with the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory to develop a COVID-19 model that provides projections for cases, hospitalizations, and deaths over a four-week period. The guiding principle for developing this model has been to support short-term operational decision-making in an effort to protect and to save more lives. Over the next 90 minutes, the teams from OCHA and Johns Hopkins will take you through the details of the model, including how to access the code and documentation, which we are making available as a global public good. We will also hear, importantly, from colleagues in Somalia and South Sudan about how the model is being used and adapted to their country context. The pandemic has created countless new challenges, and there is therefore an imperative to accelerate new approaches to humanitarian response. Because of access constraints, we have seen more use of cash and voucher-based assistance. And the response has become more locally led, both of which are positive trends. The same can be said about predictive analytics. As the tools of data science become more powerful and the quality of data improves, there is an opportunity to rethink how we make decisions in the humanitarian sector. Instead of responding once a crisis has materialized, we can act ahead of a possible crisis, averting a worst case scenario. To make this shift, we will need to learn to apply models effectively, understand their limitations, but when appropriate, use their insights to act fast and to have no regrets. A final word of thanks to the partnerships that have made this work possible. I'd like to acknowledge in particular, the Rockefeller Foundation and the governments of the Netherlands, Germany, Belgium and the United Kingdom, as well as the municipality of The Hague for their generous support to OCHA's Center for Humanitarian Data. Thank you, Laura, and back to you. Okay, colleagues, I'm sorry about this. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties with Laura. Um, I'm just going to pop in here and introduce myself. I'm Kareem Albayar. I'm the Center's Partnerships Manager. And um, I'm going to now introduce Evan Tukovsky. Evan Tukovsky is uh, Rockefeller's, the Rockefeller Foundation's, um, excuse me, Director and Lead Data Scientist for Innovation. We're very pleased to have him here with us today. Evan, without further ado, um, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you, Priam, and thank you, Lauren, earlier for the uh, kind words and everything. Uh, so yeah, as Krim said, I am Evan Toski. I'm a director and lead data scientist at the foundation. Also a proud funder and partner of OCHA's work uh, with John Hopkins on this project. So, so excited to be here at this sort of launch moment. Um, our team at the foundation uh, focuses on translating the best research models, so tools that work uh, say for a group of researchers in academia or in an institute into applied predictive analytics tools that can be used say for uh, a team within a OCHA country office. This is something we've been doing for years across um, various development and humanitarian um, sort of type models. Um, and you know, it's not that this area has been a backwater, it's been very exciting. There's been a lot of different research, but COVID has really turned up the heat and it, it's caused the staff to look at these things and say, you know, we need these models to work faster and we need them to work under higher stakes. COVID has essentially been a proving ground for what we've all been talking about uh, for years with predictive analytics, driving better decisions, driving better allocations of resources, and helping policymakers overall. 
Um, and we've seen you know, the need for translation of these models, what before would be projects that would take us say months or years, we would sit down with the team, understand their research, test that, have a process for reducing it to users, et cetera. We've seen that process be cut down to, we need to accelerate this work in days or weeks. Um, we need uh, that model to work today for a new city when yesterday I was working for this other city in a, a completely different area. And that's been a really exciting process because I think largely um, the field has met the moment. Uh, there have of course been some fobbles, there have been models that haven't proven out or have proven difficult, but largely speaking, I think our predictive analytics tools have been a net positive in our response uh, to COVID around the world. And I think there are two things uh, that I'd like to highlight that are, are exemplars of success. And I think the OSHA team does this extremely well, but the, the two lessons we've learned are, first, um, in this process of modeling, it's, it's not a sterile process, it's not a sort of hermetically sealed thing where you know, an insight goes over and decision maker kind of salutes and then goes and implements. It really is based on trusted relationships between a modeler and a set of decision makers. And the reason why this trust is so important is because crisis is a time with a lot of noise, a lot of data. Um, it isn't just the, the PDF that maybe say an OCHA team is sending over that a decision maker is getting. They're getting text messages, they're getting signals, they're seeing charts on media outlets, et cetera. And all of this noise, what cuts through that is trusted relationships, knowing who to look with, knowing who you know, um, has a track record, knowing who understands your context, your needs, your constituencies. And that trust um, is really what undergirds some of the most successful modeling teams that we've seen, including the OCHA team and, and their work. Um, the second thing uh, that we've learned throughout this process is you have to treat the outputs of these models as its own distinct product. And it's really important to think about that product from a perspective of user driven research, understanding, testing, iterating if that isn't working. And I think when we've seen modeling fail, it's because teams have taken models that might be intended for one purpose, say a, recommending a policy decision, and have tried to readapt them or deploy them for a different type of user need, say resource allocation. And when, when that happens, when you kind of go cross purposes, um, the, the models tend to, the assumptions are often invalidated, but also the folks who are deploying those models tend not to be happy with the results. They tend to say, you know, this doesn't work for me. It doesn't fit the needs I have. And so I'm going to go on to one of the, you know, 40 other teams that's been emailing me today, or I'm going to go to one of the other data sources that someone's pushing, or, you know, I'm just going to go with my gut and respond to the political, you know, needs and desires of, of my constituents and community. And so this treating the model output as a product has been a hallmark of, of successful work across the sector. Um, and yeah, those two lessons for us, I think it's so excited that the OCHA work uh, with our friends at Johns Hopkins has been um, hugely in that vein. And we're so excited to see it now released um, as open source tools so that others can benefit. And this can be, um, in addition to the sort of focused application, more of a public good. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Kareem and, and thank you all. I'm looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Evan, very much for that. Um, and, uh, and now I'm going to go ahead and introduce Leonardo Milano, who is our team lead for predictive analytics at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. Leonardo is going to give us a quick overview of the uh, predictive analytics work stream. So Leonardo, over to you, please. Thank you, Karim, and welcome, um, everyone. So let me just say a couple of words to introduce the, uh, the, the center. Uh, predictive analytics team and the activities uh, that we are uh, doing as part of this uh, uh, this work. So let me start by saying that this year has been a truly exciting year. So we launched officially the predictive analytics team uh, a little more than one year ago in September 2019. At that time, we decided to expand the scope of the uh, of the work of the center to look at predictive analytics. And this year we understood how big the demand uh, for this type of support in the sector is. Um, humanitarian organizations are more and more interested in including models and projections in their decision-making. And the center is providing support by providing expertise and capability that may not be available uh, otherwise. As you see from the slide, our strategy around predictive analytics is structured around three core areas. So the first one is modeling. OCHA was missing some of the technical skills that would allow it to benefit from the, the potential of predictive analytics. And to give you some highlights, this year we have supported the implementation of three anticipatory action pilots 
um, together with colleagues from uh, the Central Emergency Response Funds, where humanitarian funds and action is released and activated on the basis of a model trigger. Specifically, we have uh, used flood prediction tools to, um, to trigger early response uh, in Bangladesh in uh, early July. And we have used drought and food security projections in Somalia and Ethiopia to anticipate food security uh, crisis. We have also supported OCHA uh, country offices and more broadly uh, humanitarian country teams in making projection of the number of people in need to support the annual response planning. That's part of the humanitarian response plan. And of course, the work that we're presenting today on COVID-19. The second area is peer review and quality assurance. We are supporting the community, making responsible use of predictive analytics. And it's important to understand the model strengths and weaknesses and the impact with our peer review uh, framework, which evaluates technical, operational, and ethical aspects of predictive models. As part of this uh, work, we are continuously engaging with the community. So please get in touch if you want to know more about the, our peer review framework. We are right now looking for experts to join our uh, pool of independent reviewers. And we're always open for uh, models willing to go through uh, an independent uh, peer review. The third one is capacity building and community. So we think that exchange is key for a successful implementation of predictive analytics. And we want to create a safe space where, where modelers and decision makers can have fruitful interactions. The number of models available with a potential application in the humanitarian sector is growing quickly. And we are maintaining a catalog of predictive models in the humanitarian sector. This is available on the center website and you're all invited to contribute to, to this. One thing that we have learned this year is that in order to generate real impact, it's not as simple as running the model and sharing the results with decision makers. And you will hear more in the coming panels. It requires engagement with decision makers. It requires contextual understanding of the, of the context and the, the operational settings, and it requires good data. Ochabaki is not the best COVID model on the market, and it has never been uh, our goal. But I think it's a model that can be helpful for, uh, for humanitarians. And this only thanks to the close engagement with country offices since the beginning of the project and the support from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. So let me wrap up by saying thanks to everyone for joining today. And I'm really pleased to see a strong representation from a wide variety of humanitarian organizations and especially colleagues in the field. So we'll have an opportunity to discuss after the presentation and I'm looking forward to collaborating with you. Thank you, over to you, Karim. Thank you very much, Leonardo. And now without further ado, we'll jump right into the technical portion of our presentations today. This is a presentation of the Ocha Bucky model. I'm very pleased to introduce Josie Poirier. I'm sure I've butchered your name. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, Josie is our predictive analytics technical specialist at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. She'll be joined now by uh, with Jason Lee. Jason Lee is the lead data scientist at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. And I'm also bringing in Matt Kinsey, who is a senior data scientist at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. So, Josie, Jason, and Matt, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are delighted to introduce our COVID-19 model called Ochat Bucky. Today, we'll discuss why there was a need for a new predictive model that was adapted for the humanitarian context. Then we will provide a technical overview of Ochat Bucky, and we'll wrap up with a discussion of how to interpret the model outputs and what Ochat Bucky can do for you. Next slide, please, Kareem. Thank you. So back in March, humanitarian decision makers were looking for guidance on the size of the outbreak and when it might peak in their locale to inform their planning and resource management. 
decisions decision makers critically needed details on the spatial and temporal unfolding of the outbreak. However, at the time, available models were not granular enough for this purpose since they typically made projections at the country level and for longer time horizons, typically six to 12 months. Given the gap, we worked with our field-based colleagues to identify the features of a model that would be suited for operational support. These features included case and hospitalization projections at the subnational level, included projections focused on the short term that are frequently updated so as to dynamically reflect the latest development on the ground. As well, projections of the trajectory of the outbreak under various scenarios of containment measures, non-pharmaceutical interventions such as road closures or school closures. And finally, the model needed to be adapted for the local context, which I will get to in a minute. So this new model clearly was needed and therefore we developed it to produce timely snapshots of the outbreak in a given region at a given time in point in time with projections that would cover the next two to four weeks, which is really the window that was of the most interest to uh, operations. Next slide, thank you. Um, so mobility, vulnerability, social contacts, exposures are typical factors of epidemic models, but we adjusted them for the humanitarian context. For mobility, for instance, which refers to uh, movement within and between regions of a country and affects the uh, geographic spread of the virus, there was no ground truth uh, data for the countries we wanted to serve. Therefore, we had to create a suitable proxy data set. For vulnerability, we took into account the realities of food insecurity and the use of indoor cooking fuels as they are associated with a weakened ability to respond to a resp respiratory illness such as COVID-19. For social contacts, which is how much people from different age, group, age groups interact and exposure, a country's unique social structure and demographics were particularly important to include in the model, which we did. Similarly, country-specific mitigation strategies were incorporated. Our field-based colleagues generated a list of the implemented NPIs, along with an estimate of compliance rates, and continuously updated the list as needed. Therefore, we had um, fresh information to incorporate in the model. And finally, and not surprisingly, we also had to work with significant data challenges, such as underreporting and incomplete or delayed data, which the model considers. And I'll pass it over to Jason, who will explain how all of, how all of these factors were built into the model. Jason, over to you. Thank you, Jose, and uh, thank you for that uh, high-level explanation. Uh, we'll dive into all of those details, uh, you know, on, on what Jose mentioned regarding the pieces, as well as some of the challenges associated with uh, each of those various pieces. But I think first, what I'd like to do is, is talk briefly about the model and the model structure and how it works. Um, so for, for those of you that are, that are modelers in the audience, this might be quite a familiar technique um, for those of you that are not familiar with modeling, uh, here is uh, you know a, a one-minute crash course. So uh, we are using what's what's called spatial SEIR model. Uh, the SEIR stands for various compartments uh, that populations are able to move through. Um, and so you can think of this as a compartmental model where people move from S susceptible to E exposed to I infectious to R recovered. Uh, and they move, the people move from these states with various probabilities that change over time and that change with respect to how many people might be exposed, right? You can imagine the more people that are exposed or the more people that are infectious, the, the more people then that will become infectious or the more people that, that will become, uh, you know, that, that will transition from susceptible to exposed or infectious. So we have these, uh, we have this basic model structure. And in order for us to model an entire country, we essentially take that model and run it at every sub region. Um, so, so for those of you in the US, think about that as counties within the United States. So we have the country and then we have the states and then we have the counties within the states. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the US, think of this as districts or uh, you know, kind of a sub-provincial geographic region. In some cases, maybe even down to a city 
uh, or, or health zone. Um, so we run a model at each one of those individual levels and then aggregate all of our results up. So we have each one of those compartments for the various regions, the S, the E, the I, the R, and then we have uh, kind of a, a way to mesh all of these things together through what Jose described earlier, mobility and contact matrices, um, the, the way for us to kind of uh, allow for the population to you know, be exposed across the various regions. And we control for that through not only our mobility stratification, but through demographic and vulnerability stratification. The demographics that we're using are primarily age-based, um, if you're familiar with COVID, you know that the case fatality rate among those that, that uh, end up with COVID-19 is much higher among older populations than it is among younger populations. So we account for that by looking at census information from the various regions um, on age breakdowns of the region and adjust our fatality rate in that region appropriately. Uh, we also adjust for vulnerability through food insecurity and comorbidity uh, metrics, primarily through uh, the use of uh, the IPC data from FuseNet, as well as from uh, the, the indoor air pollution metrics that are available on HDX. So using those things, we are then able to kind of get a, a sense of how vulnerable a region is to additional uh, respiratory disease. So we're able to take all of this together and then, uh, you know, approximate these uh, the, the contact between these subregions using road network data. We're thinking about, you know, if there's a highway that moves from one area to another, that might mean that there's a higher rate of contact between those areas as opposed to if there's a tertiary road or if there's, uh, you know, a, a two regions that might be geographically disparate or separated by, uh, you know, water or a desert then those two regions may not be uh, as connected. So we think about all of these things to bring together uh, you know, one model for the entire country and are able to, to output not only models for the entire country um, on number of cases, number of deaths, severe cases, and whatnot, but down to a regional level as well, uh, you know, trying to, to go to the sub-national level. So, um, I will go ahead and turn it over to Matt, who will describe some of the, the input parameters in detail. And uh, Matt, off you go. All right, thanks, Jason. Um, so from our perspective in modeling, uh, we've tried to be as data-driven as possible. Uh, so really, the model tends to be pretty data-hungry. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the pretty much the minimum set of data that you need in order to run the model and talk about some of the considerations that we had to factor in in the humanitarian context. So. To me, I apologize, I'm going a little bit out of order. Um, kind of fundamental is the disease parameters. So we're getting these primarily from the US CDC's estimates, um, but we believe they're transferable into humanitarian contexts, largely because they're intrinsic to the disease itself. So I'm talking about things like percentage of asymptomatic cases, um, things like that. Uh, there's a few that we're using, things like case fatality ratios. So, you know, the fraction of people that will, you know, have a fatal outcome, given that they're a case, um, that we have to kind of readjust to the humanitarian context, right? So the vulnerability of your average person in, say, the US is a little bit different than these countries. So for that, uh, I think, uh, Jose mentioned this, uh, we're calculating what we call a vulnerability index. So it's really just kind of a regional estimate of the number of people that are particularly vulnerable to a severe case of a respiratory disease. So for this, we're getting a lot of data from OSHA and HDX in particular uh, on things like food insecurity, uh, indoor air pollution rates, and we're kind of munging it all together in order to build up a fraction of people per region that we expect to be particularly vulnerable. And uh, I think we already alluded to this a little bit, but in a lot of other contexts, we have mobility data that is actual kind of ground truth mobility data. So it's derived from things like cell phone usage. Um, we don't really have that in the context of these humanitarian, uh, the country of humanitarian interest. 
So we did a little work with the, uh, our partners at OSHA, uh, developed some methods to take data that they had on transportation networks, uh, roads, and use that as a proxy for inter-regional mobility, and intra-regional mobility as well. Uh, the other thing, so this might be familiar for anyone that is you know, particularly in the weeds with disease modeling, but um, the Premidol paper from, I wanna say about three years ago, they published, uh, it's a series of matrices that describe the rate at which people in different age groups interact with each other, given different contexts, like school work, uh, at home, things like that. Uh, the problem is, so we depend pretty heavily on that, uh, just because we're age stratifying the model. Um, the problem is that's based on survey data that we don't necessarily have coverage of in the countries of interest here. So uh, our partners at OSHA have worked with the country offices to kind of come up with a way to transfer the uh, contact matrices to the countries that we're looking at. So things like finding cultural similarities to countries we do have coverage on, uh, that type of stuff. Um, and then, you know, the, our final inputs are really just kind of the standard stuff like uh, demographics per admin two region. Uh, we obviously need that for age stratifying the model. And then as up to date historical case and death data as possible, because we want to start the model, you know, as close to now as we possibly can. So I think with that, uh, back to you, Jason. Thanks, Matt. So the one thing that we have not touched on to date, as far as uh, the, this model is, is concerned, is non-pharmaceutical interventions or, or NPIs. And so, you know, this is really, I think, the, the primary use case for this model is to then kind of scenario plan um, out various uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that, that might uh, be for consideration by a Ministry of Health or be, be up for consideration by a, uh, by a local government entity. Um, and there are, I, I think, a few different ways that we can think about NPIs uh, as we were. And they're, they're all listed on this slide here, so I can go from left to right. Uh, the first are social modifications. You can think of this as ways for us to, uh, you know, reduce somebody's exposure. Think about this, uh, you know, as as closure of businesses, closure of restaurants, uh, reduced hours, um, you know, shielding of certain uh, immunocompromised populations, and things of that nature. Uh, move, moving further, we then have healthcare access, and this is uh, something that I think you know is is built in, you know, as we think about case fatality rate and who is getting the proper something like setting up a field hospital or um, you know setting up hand washing stations things of that nature distribu distribution of masks um, all of those things uh, that that might tamp down on the severity of the cases in a region it's not going to necessarily prevent exposure as much as it is going to prevent severity of the disease uh, kind of reducing that viral load and, and hoping that, that the cases that do come through are asymptomatic or mild. Uh, limiting geographic movement, we've, we've touched on this quite a bit already, um, so I'll be brief on this. This is things like uh, restrictions, closure of airports, closure of roads, uh, curfews that might be in place. Uh, you can also think of this as, uh, you know, again, shielding of the immunocompromised population. That's kind of a mix of uh, of a couple of these things. You can think of shielding the elderly as a limit of geographic movement to some extent. Uh, and then finally, medical and humanitarian intervention. This is all about reducing the vulnerabilities inherent to the population. So if there's food insecurity in a region, for instance, um, what are the ways that we can uh, you know, reduce that, that vulnerability as much as possible temporarily or, or semi-permanently through you know, food drops through markets, through, you know, uh, buyback programs and things of that nature. If there are comorbidities in place from, from indoor air pollution, how, how do we best reduce those comorbidities so that the population is less vulnerable to these diseases? Um, so 
you know, again, think of that as, uh, you know, just kind of different and varying ways for us to model this. Uh, we, we take in a ton of non-pharmaceutical interventions already through the ACAPS database, which is available on, on HDX. And for those not familiar with the ACAPS database, it's essentially a list of every non-pharmaceutical intervention put into place by any government or any region um, to date. So, for instance, we have, you know, things like, you know, Juba in South Sudan implemented a curfew. This is just an example. Um, from you know April 15th to May 30th, and then that curfew was lifted, and then it was put back into place on on day Y. Um, things of that nature are are what we have from ACAP. So we're able to kind of see that, and kind of adjust uh, you know the 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 model parameters to what we see. Uh, it's important to realize here that that you know we're relying on the country offices as well to tell us okay you know this. Yes, but is it actually being complied with, or is it just kind of in place and people aren't really complying with the, you know, with the intervention? And so we really rely on on qualitative feedback from the country offices uh, that that OCHA has in these, you know, in these countries where we're modeling to say, okay, you know, Juba's implemented a curfew. Is it being followed? How rigidly is it being followed and enforced? Um, and that will affect then kind of the effects. Uh, that, that we put into place in our model. We then model out two scenarios, and Jose will get, get to this in a, in a little bit, but we model out essentially what would happen in the next four weeks if the NPIs that are in place now with the compliance level that they're at remain in place versus what happens if all of the NPIs are lifted, right? And, and you can think then that there are very uh, easy ways to then modify that to whatever scenario planning uh, a, a country officer or region might want to put into place. If they're considering an NPI, uh, we can model that. If they're uh, considering lifting certain NPI but leaving others in place or putting new ones in place in certain regions, right? These are all things that, be, that, that can be accounted for using OCHA Bucky. Next slide, please, Kareem. So I'll touch briefly here on features and limitations, um, and, and some of these have been touched on already. Um, so I, I think as Jose mentioned earlier, this model is calibrated to short-term estimates. Four weeks uh, is, is what we're looking at. Um, we estimate simulation parameters based on the biology, the biological parameters from the US CDC, as well as past data from the countries and regions. We essentially take in four weeks of data to predict out four weeks of data. And uh, you know uh, that that is essentially the limit at which we 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 wish to predict. We could go further, uh, but there is a significant kind of error that can result from that. Significant noise that can result from that. That kind of leads me to my second point here. The model is robust to the quality and the resolution of the input data. So that means that if there's incomplete or if there's inaccurate data, that's going to induce noise in in, in our results. The primary case of this is when we have missing data, often shown as zero cases, right? We're not sure what a zero means, right? It could mean there are actually no cases in that region. It could mean there's a reporting delay. Uh, it, it could mean that there was no testing available in that region that day. And so there's no way for us to know how many cases there are, right? This is all dependent on the accuracy of the data from the Ministry of Health and from the WHO. And we take in both of those data sources to kind of get an idea uh, as to how accurate the, the individual regional data might be, and if there are gaps or if there are uh, things that we might need to adjust for, how we then adjust for them. The last uh, bullet here is that the, the results here provide a range of estimates. So we, we, uh, we model in a Monte Carlo kind of simulation where we essentially run a simulation uh, about a thousand times and, uh, you know, get out a number of results that produces a range of results. And that's, you know, can be good, um, but can be noise inducing, right? We can, we can see a wide range of results from time to time. And so I think it's important here for us to realize, you know, this model is not the single source of truth as Leonardo mentioned earlier. And, and, you know, a quote here from a famous statistician from Britain, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Um, and it's important for us to, to realize that the model is not the end source of truth. In fact, 
it may very well be wrong, uh, but you know we're we're modeling in a certain kind of niche and in a certain area, right? We're we're designing this model to answer the operational questions that may be of need and to advise the planning scenarios. It should not be the the sole source of truth. So the model should be used in consultation with the experts, uh, with the with the folks on the ground, and with uh, you know other other models, other uh, you know longer term projections to then think about what should be put into place. Jose, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jason. In the interest of time, I'll kind of wrap up fairly quickly, but we want to make sure that uh, we talk about actual communications and the interpretation of the output. So Uchad Bucky was developed as an operations support tool, but to be impactful, predictive analytics, generally speaking, must be clearly communicated and actionable. So the center produces reports that include all of these estimates and trends and graphs that we just discussed to help um, country offices in particular understand their, where they stand uh, with respect to the crisis. As you can tell, just point out to the fact that we present, for instance, the two scenarios of what is projected to happen with the current implemented NPIs versus if the NPIs are implemented or lifted rather, and also uh, a map that is color coded to reflect the risk level of um, based on incidents and whether containment is um, within reach or whether more stringent measures should be considered. So this framework is actually used to facilitate the interpretation and the decision decision making based on the data and is borrowed uh, from the Harvard Global Health Institute and their partners. Next slide, please, um, Kareem. So to learn more about it, it's those reports by the way, are published bi-weekly. We update them frequently uh, and they are publicly available. You can see the link here to go and look at them. But importantly for us today, we are excited to release Ocha Bucky so that it can have a broader impact. We hope that more people will use it and provide feedback so we can continuously improve it. To use the model, interested parties will download the code, adjust the parameters for this country of interest, and run simulations. The do documentation walks the reader through how to do that. Uh, as Jason just alluded to, you, Ocha Bucky can be used as a simulation tool for specific scenarios. So go ahead and explore to understand what the outbreak trajectory might be in uh, your area of interest. For next steps, APL and the Center for Humanitarian Data will continue refining the model and incorporating feedback from our partners who are using the tool. So please reach out with feedback or if we can be of help and we hope that Ocha Bucky will be useful to you. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. And I'm delighted to be rejoining you. And uh, I'd like to thank my internet service provider for that re reminder of uh, technological frailty uh, and the wibbles of um, infrastructure. I hope that I can stay with you for the rest of this conversation because we have another very interesting panel and we will come back to our previous panelists for the Q&A session later. We've got some excellent and rather technical questions, which we are compiling and we will come back to um, in a few minutes. But first, I'm delighted to open now the second panel discussion, um, where we'll look a little bit at the use and the future plans for the model. Um, so I'm going to introduce each panelist in turn and, um, and then ask them to actually tell them, tell us a little bit about their role um, and their daily work. Um, and then I, I have a question for each of them and then we'll have a discussion and then we'll begin to bring in your questions. So do keep them coming through the Q&A function. Um, so first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Mamanur Rahman Malik, the representative and head of mission for the WHO, the World Health Organization in Somalia. Dr. Malik, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Good afternoon. Oh, wonderful. Good morning. Well, welcome. And it would be great if you could introduce yourself, as I said, and tell us a little bit about your daily work and also um, give us an, an overview of the situation in Somalia at the moment. How is the WHO responding to COVID-19 and how will the model support you and support your priorities? Thank you very much. Uh, just let me say that this COVID outbreak continues to evolve in Somalia like any other countries. The trajectory keeps rapidly changing. Of course, at this point in time, we are seeing a low transmission rate, but there are no predictions that it will remain so. When the first case was reported in March, uh, this country had no testing facility or capability. There was no functioning surveillance system. There were only seven ventilators in a country of 15 million people. 
none of the health facilities had any access to medical oxygen. The health workforce density in this country is one of the lowest in the world. Only 25% of the people can access health services in Somalia. So during this time, there was complete chaos, confusion, and complete dysfunction of the health system when the virus was introduced on 16th of March. We were also deeply concerned how this virus will behave in this fragile and weakened health system. But we, the agencies, did not want to lose this battle without a fight. We thought crisis can bring the best of humanity. Crisis can unlock opportunity. It was our testing time. In October, seven months since the first case of reported, we are seeing fewer deaths and fewer cases in this country than what was apprehended before. There are only 3,900 cases and close to 104 deaths, but it is far from over. We have seen pockets of vulnerability and geographically defined location where the virus continues to circulate. What we have done over the past few months is the WHO has partnered with other agencies and helped set up five testing laboratories which are functioning. We have developed uh, or we have deployed close to 3,500 community healthcare workers who are our contact tracers and case identifiers. We have set up 19 designated hospitals for patient care, ensuring oxygen availability. We have also set up a functioning system that can pick up a case early one. Our strength was unity, solidarity, and compassion. We are also gathering and analyzing the data and using the data to measure the effectiveness of the ongoing interventions. Of course, we have also launched a number of studies to address some of the critical knowledge gaps that we have currently to understand the impact of COVID-19 on health systems. We are continuously assessing the evolving risk on a regular basis and this understanding is helping us to shape our operational response. Here comes the value of OCHA's predictive model, which we are finding immensely useful and is stimulating. We all know infectious disease modeling is challenging. The modelers use several assumptions and a range of uncertainties. We have already seen some conflicting and contradicting conclusions from different models. We are not a fortune teller, and neither we can do miracles in a short time span to save thousands of lives, which the modelers always pinpoint. Against this backdrop, the strength of ultra predictive model lies in its use as a planning and operational tool. It is helping us to predict that trajectory in a realistic manner. We are extensively using it, and the short-term forecast of this model is allowing us to target interventions in a specific geographic locations. The model is keeping our operational readiness focused. The model is giving us a better value to measure our work in the face of limitations that all we all are facing in, for collecting reliable data from the field. We are using this model extensively in our operational planning and decision-making purposes. Every model has limitations. We are not living in a perfect world. If we have reliable data, we can make better estimates. We can also make better projections that will support better operational decisions. But it is a moral imperative that we understand these granularities and use this information to better plan and respond to this crisis of this nature. Thank you very much and back to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Dr. Malik, and we're so very glad to have you on the panel today. And we have many questions coming up for you, so don't go away. Um, in the meantime, I'm delighted to introduce and hand over now to, um, to Pabalo Masala, who is the Information Management Officer for OCHA in South Sudan. Pabalo, welcome. Um, we, if you could introduce yourself and your, your daily work um, for us, that would be great. And also we would like similarly to hear an overview of the situation currently in South Sudan. How is OCHA and the wider humanitarian system responding to COVID? And what do you see as the potential for the OCHA Bucky model to support this work? Thank you, Laura. And uh, I hope I'm coming through clear. So um, a lot of uh, what uh, Dr. Malik is just uh, uh, spoken about uh, rings true to the South Sudan situation as well in terms of, of, of the context. So um, I'll, I'll be brief and give a brief overview as, well, as to what is, uh, has happened. So uh, starting off with my, my role, uh, I've been 
uh, focus largely uh, with uh, the Ministry of Health and uh, WHO uh, providing information management support, but under a coordination structure uh, that was uh, supported, that was uh, put in place by OCHA and the humanitarian partners in South Sudan to support uh, the general public health coordination. So there is a, a bit of a bespoke um, situation that has uh, evolved within uh, uh, South Sudan. Now, in brief, uh, as you may know, uh, in South Sudan, we were amongst the last 10 nations globally to, to actually register a, COVID, a positive COVID-19 uh, case. And um, this was reported on the 5th of uh, April. However, given uh, all of the, 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 what was going on in, uh, around the world and uh, uh, the situation that was uh, probably, you know, eventually did come through to South Sudan, um, a lot of the preparedness activities had begun early on um, around February, taking uh, into consideration all of the, all of the stuff that's going around the world. Uh, this included the development of a COVID-19 national response plan and the activation of the incident management system uh, under the directive of the Ministry of Health. And of course, with the joint cooperation of all the international uh, partners uh, on the ground. Now, alongside this, there was a development, of course, of the, the you know, addendum to the HRP to include uh, the COVID-19 aspect, which at the time was an unknown. And this, this uh, tried its best to articulate the needs uh, that uh, the pandemic uh, would place uh, to South Sudan and especially to the, huma the ongoing humanitarian uh, response effort. Um, so yeah, at the time it would have been great to have uh, historical data or have uh, modeling like, like the Bucky tool to, to, to provide a better uh, outlook as to what uh, would possibly uh, transpire in South Sudan. Uh, to date, South Sudan has just under 3,000 cases and uh, confirmed. And yeah, this is a modest figure in the greater scheme of the, the pandemic globally, but uh, uh, given the context that South Sudan is in where the, there are extremely limited resources for the most basic, basic of uh, health-related activities and we uh, remain constrained um, to, to respond to any health related activities, uh, not only just uh, COVID, but malaria and cholera. Um, and looking across the borders uh, in Ethiopia, in the East Africa region, in, in Uganda, where there has been uh, recent surges of COVID cases, uh, South Sudan finds itself in a, in, a, in a scenario where additional challenges are going to be uh, placed on top of this uh, weak public health system. And of course, the vulnerable, uh, vulnerable uh, population groups in South Sudan. Uh, this is obviously, obviously further compounded by the escalation of other drivers of humanitarian needs. So currently we have a flood response that's ongoing that uh, needs prioritization of, uh, of uh, limited resources. So just to close up, yes, the modeling um, of, 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 the, of the Bucky uh, tool would have uh, contribu has contributed greatly uh, for, um, to South Sudan. Um, and uh, having this uh, as a regular output uh, uh, has allowed us to look at the scenarios on a regular basis and reprioritize based on, 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 on the current needs in the country. Um, these scenarios have had an influence on the public health planning and prioritization and the best use uh, of the scarce resources that we have in South Sudan in the country. Oh. Well, thanks so much for that overview and for joining us. Um, and it's good to hear that uh, all the potential uses of the model for uh, very clearly very practical and necessary means. Um, I want to now bring in Shelby, Dr. Shelby Wilson, uh, for, who is a senior s scientist at JHU APL. Shelby, welcome. And if you also wouldn't mind telling us a bit about your day job and introducing yourself, um, as you also share with us um, why you all are working so hard on this model and sharing it with the world. What for you is the benefit and the value of making the model a digital public good? Could you speak a bit to that? Hello, oh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. So my name is Shelby Wilson. I am a, a senior mathematical scientist at JHU APL. And uh, my area of expertise is in mathematical biology, specifically in modeling the spread of infectious diseases. And as you can imagine with uh, the current COVID pandemic that has, has kept uh, all of us in this field very, very busy. And what has been um, very, very important in this context is that at the start of, of the COVID pandemic, first, there were no models to model COVID globally. And more specifically, there were no models like this that were publicly available specifically for the countries that were in humanitarian needs. And um, as was highlighted very well in the technical discussion, um, 
there are specific channel challenges to be overcome in these in these areas and these domains. And uh, what we have done is we have worked very, very hard to do this um, to address those concerns. And by publishing this model, what we hope is to number one, to be of use to um, the humanitarian sector to help direct resources to make decisions. We also very much so welcome feedback and, and to make this publicly available such that we can uh, serve you and serve the scientific community and the humanitarian community equally better. And uh, finally, I'll wrap up by saying that for us, this we view this very much so as a start. So in this, uh, the general area of modeling to support humanitarian needs, humanitarian sector, um, we believe that, that this partnership from APL through OSHA and otherwise um, will allow us to, to follow the needs of what, where the country offices are, for instance, uh, malaria, cholera, things like that. These are things that we have the capability to develop models for and um, look forward to supporting these efforts in the future. Thank you so much, Shelby. And it's a pleasure to have you with us and look forward to uh, having you join us for the discussion, uh, this whole discussion as we start to address some audience questions. And just a reminder that you can contribute those through the Q&A button. Um, for the audience. And then, so I want to finally, last but not least, bring in um, Leonardo Milano, um, the team lead for predictive analytics at OCHA's Center for Humanitarian Data. Hi, um, and we have, we would like to be you to introduce yourself and also um, if you could share a little bit more about the role that the data center has played in developing the model and what was special about the collaboration with JHU APL. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, so I am Leonardo Milano. I'm leading the predictive analytics team at the center. And uh, so in terms of the role of the center, um, so Ocha Bakke has been the first model developed by, by the center and by Ocha and deployed to, uh, to country offices and that we use to inform country offices. And the, the centers play really the role of the intermediary between the field and the, uh, our technical experts, in this case, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And I really think that this is the way the center can bring value. And basically by understanding the demand and the needs from the field and translating this into, if you want, technical specifications for, uh, for the modelers. Um, when we launched our new strategy, the center strategy, we used the analogy of a flywheel. Uh, that is a, you know, a rotational device that stores energy to explain how we can create compounded momentum to drive value for more and more people. And we identified the three elements that are turning the, the center's flywheel. These are data, partnerships, and trust. And I think kind of Ochabaki is kind of a realization of the center's flywheel. Uh, let me explain. Uh, so given the position of the center within Ocha, and the thanks to the fact that we work in direct support to the field, we have a good understanding of what country offices need and of the data landscape. So back in March, when we received the request for a COVID-19 projection, the first office was the Af Afghanistan office. Uh, we looked at the existing models on the market and realized that they were not exactly what country offices were looking for. In order to respond to the demand from the country offices, we established a partnership with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory to develop what then became uh, Ocha, Ocha Baki. Now, because we work with the field offices and we have a well-known and well-established technical partner like JHU uh, APL, the country office and our other partners became aware of our work and trusted our model. Now, because they were trusting our model, they started engaging and that's something you know, that we have seen. They started engaging more actively and shared more data and also contributed to the overall improvement of all Ocha Bag. So they started engaging really in the, uh, in the model development. So in this way, the model got better and also the, the trust from partners increased. So, and this allowed us to create new partnerships such as 
WHO and also uh, at the country at, uh, uh, at the uh, at quarter levels. These new partnerships brought new ideas and new sources. And that's what we see today also with uh, all uh, the people that join the event today. So I just want to say that Ochabaki and the development of this model has been a huge opportunity for us to learn. And we think that this three-way collaboration between the field as the main problem owner, the center as the intermediary between the, the field and technical experts, in this case, APL, is a successful business model. And we will try as much as possible to replicate it in the future. Great. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much for that response, Leonardo. And um, I have a couple of questions um, and I might be cheeky and abuse my privilege as moderator and ask one of my own, first of all, um, which is, and we, have, we are getting lots of questions about this from, um, from others as well. Um, the, one of the challenges that I have in, in our work with Dial looking at using um, private data, so mobile data, for example, for public policy decision-making is then working with governments to understand how to use the analytics that come from as the end result and making sure that when we are that we are clear about the accuracy of the analytics and the extent to which they should inform decision making and how important it is to bring in other sources um, i i find that to be a challenge i think it's um it's we very commonly um are, are very keen to underscore as you have been that no model is completely correct and that it is all about informing analysis with trends but how do we make sure that decision makers who may not be technologists, who may be very new to using this kind of data are not over-reliant on these kinds of models? Um, and any of you who would like to respond to that may do so. Okay, well, I guess I will answer. Hello, Shelby here. Um, so I think that what I am uh, extremely proud about about this collaboration is in fact that the, the, the three armed approach that Leonardo mentioned. I think that it is very easy as a technical person to uh, kind of uh, sit in your basement and to come up with answers that aren't operational. But I think that it has been um, quite appealing for us to have input from the country offices, from conversations with people with boots on the ground to let them direct the need. And I think that that conversation goes both ways, very much so. And so I think that um, there, there are a number of factors that, you know, we come in with our perspectives and think that this is the case. And for instance, one in one country might uh, say, no, that's not quite what it is here. And another country might say something different. Like this is, this is what we would like to see more of. And to be able to kind of iterate, like if the living breathing model has been very, very important. So I think that hopefully um, through this collaboration, we're getting um, the information that that the country offices want in order to help them to make decisions. But at the end of the day, they are the boots on the ground. So for instance, things like compliance, we can't estimate compliance. And so we need uh, that input to, to let us know, to direct us in which ways our schools open, our schools close, you know, these types of information, the state of the healthcare system, these are information that we are able to take in from boots on the ground. And we always, always uh, defer to the information that comes from our partners um, who, are, who are in their respective uh, countries. Thank you, Shelby. Did anyone else want to pick up on that question before we move on? All right. Um, so I, I wonder whether um, we could, and we, we, we have many questions to ask about the data, but I wonder whether um, one other question is, is just to understand um, the, the implication of using this, um, obviously this kind of technology becomes so important because of the COVID-19 response, because we are less able to travel um, but then in testing live and under duress, these kind of innovative models, it then becomes more important that we can check what's happening. So how do we balance the twin pressures to use technology um, and modeling um, to help solve operational challenges, but also to be constrained operationally? And perhaps this is a, a question for our OCHA and WHO colleagues. Um, you know, to be constrained uh, operationally, how does that impact um, the way that you're able to test, to train, to roll out this kind of work and thinking? 
Um, I could I could give it a stab as well. Um, Please. The, so for us, um, uh, the use of the modeling um, is extremely or well, was extremely beneficial in the sense that in the beginning, and I think this is this is true for everybody around the world. Nobody quite knew what a world with COVID was like. Um, and um, I just look back at when we first did up, well, when we were in a preparedness space because we had a case quite late. Uh, I look at uh, the scenarios that we had uh, had uh, had drawn up, and I'm looking at uh, the cases now. And um, looking at it, we've 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 had it pan out quite differently. So um, these types of of of, of modelings and analysis are are really beneficial um, from the get go. I guess to 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 feed into into the planning um, and and then especially in our context where we have extremely re, uh, constrained resources. Um, uh, so we need to we need to make sure we ration out those resources properly, and um, not to answer on uh, how did how did it affect us while we were uh, I guess within the, within lockdown and, and constrained. Uh, it, it becomes hard to 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 verify I guess the effectiveness of these models in the ground, but uh, on the ground. But it's a, it's 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 with partner with partner collaboration and uh, with uh, colleagues that are in the field. Uh, we were able to at least somehow try and feed into uh, the overall data collection processes and try and, 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 and verify how accurate these these type of modelings can be. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is it is a bit of a challenge that uh, that we were faced with, but uh, it, 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 we needed something tangible to hold on to so that we could do some planning and, and these, this is where it becomes beneficial. Okay. Uh, Thanks so much. Yes, please, Dr. Yeah, I, I think the what is important to understand that there will always be heaps and bucks, and no country has been able to collect reliable data, not only from uh, this uh, for COVID-19, but maybe for other infectious diseases. We apply a lot of assumptions, we apply a lot of levels of uncertainties, but what is important that such models which make short-term projections also stimulates for collecting data in a reliable manner, in a consistent manner, because it also challenges the people to collect reliable data to get a better estimates. Nothing is perfect, but again, I think that stimulation is important. So provoking the healthcare workers to collect better quality data so that we can have better estimates. And, but the truth will be in between somewhere. But I think there should be some projections that will make us move forward rather than having nothing on the ground. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Malik. Now I want to turn now to and our- If I can ask. Oh, yes, go ahead. Leonardo, please. I just wanted to add that, so we're always, so just wanted to add that from our perspective, working on Ochabaki was really an opportunity to improve the data that we have on HDX for the countries that we were working on, just because the fact that we were looking at the data and we were using the data as input for the Bucky model was really a key for getting better data. So th there's also this, uh, uh, you know, this feedback loop uh, in uh, uh, using, uh, you know, the data provided by, by the authorities and by WHO in, uh, uh, in, in the modeling work. Thank you. And HDX, of course, the Humanitarian Data Exchange, which is also hosted by the Humanitarian Data Center. Um, so I want to turn now to our public questions um, that we have. And the, for the first question, I'm really delighted to be actually calling on Siobhan Green, who is the co-lead of the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office's COVID Action Data Challenge. Siobhan, welcome. Thank I you. also want to quickly take the opportunity to thank you and the United Kingdom for your support to the OCHA Bucky model. You've been one of the key donors for this work, and we are very grateful. Um, so I think you have a question for the panelists. Mm -hmm. Take it away, I, Siobhan. I do. Um, thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you also to the panelists for a really insightful presentation so far. Very, very interesting. Um, through the, the FCDO COVID Action Program, we reviewed dozens of EPI models that were being used to address COVID. Um, and we were really focusing on those that were mature and promoted data use at the local level, right? That prioritized local decision-making information because we saw that as something that was a critical need. Uh, and I think that 
everything, this presentation has reiterated that. So one of the reasons why the Ochibaki model was chosen as one of the EPI models was because of it exemplifies this approach. Um, now we're eight, nine months into the COVID pandemic and we have new challenges coming along, um, such as vaccines, such as long-term responses. One of the questions we have for you is how do you see this tool potentially being scaled and applied to future challenges, such as identification of vaccine distribution is one key example people are talking about. Um, and also, where do you see some barriers to potentially that scaling and expansion? And most importantly, where do you think donors can be the most effective at supporting uh, that scaling and expansion? Hi, uh, Shelby Wilson here, APL. So I think that you have uh, hit the nail on the head where kind of all of us are thinking right now and, and mm -hmm. it's uh, exciting to be able to talk about this. I think that there are a number of middle and long-term outcomes that we're currently looking at. We had a very, very long and fruitful discussion just yesterday about things exactly, vaccinations, where should the vaccines mm -hmm. go and when? Like those are important questions. And those are questions that within the framework of the OSHA Bucky model that we have the capability to answer. We also have the capability to answer things like the interplay between uh, COVID and other seasonal diseases such as malaria, um, cholera, yeah. these types of things. And so, and also I would say for us where where um, more financial support it would be of course in data accuracy we can only be mm -hmm. as accurate as as the data that is provided to us and part of that is us buy-in from our partners but part of it is just access to be able to collect that data and report it in a way such that we can um can use it fruitfully. And also I think just a general overall program um, leading towards enhanced surveillance, having better situational awareness around the world, because now that it's developed, we're, we're ready to make modifications for the next pandemic. We won't be starting from, from scratch. And I think that we, we are in a better position, number one, to answer, how do we continue with Bucky? And number two, to answer what are the long-term outcomes? What are the long-term outcomes of acute food insecurity, about vulnerability, about children missing vaccines? Um, so we're in a position now where we can start to answer those middle and long-term questions now that we have a model that we feel um, confident about its output um, in, in, in any current time period. And Leonardo here, is, if I can add to what Shelby ju just said, maybe on the role of donors. I think, um, well, first of all, like supporting this type of projects, and I should also mention, well, that you mentioned use of data. I mean, we are promoting as much as possible responsible use of data, and that's in line also with the work done by uh, the data responsibility team to support you know, safe management of sensitive data during the during the crisis. But a big challenge is really, uh, you know, capacity at the at the field level. So maybe investing in data literacy and capacity building to really help decision makers be comfortable in uh, using this type of tools and this type of uh, analytics. And then the other big challenge has been around, you know, data availability. So maybe, you know, promoting and supporting data sharing and supporting data infrastructure to have more local, fresh and complete uh, data. Uh, I think it's uh, important aspects. Thank you. If I could also just uh, add um, on to what Leonardo has said in terms of the building of capacity uh, amongst uh, our local partners and obviously in the field locations uh, in the context of South Sudan, that's, and I'm pretty sure that's, this is the same in many other locations. Uh, this is our biggest problem um, where in fact, almost uh, we're 90 almost more than 90% of our testing is coming from um, the screening of travelers and from the capital basically. So we're seeing uh, an explicit large gap of, of, the, of um, and ability for us to to, to strengthen data uh, collection and and uh, in the field locations, and um, going forward, I, I also feel the model could be very useful in um, highlighting the possible impacts uh, a pandemic such as COVID may have on uh, again uh, the South Sudan context where we have a, an ongoing humanitarian response and. Uh, 
what that means for the different clusters or sectors or different aspects of that of that response and how it could uh, possibly impede those those uh, response efforts. Uh, Thank you. And thank you, Siobhan, for your question. Um, it's lovely having you here. Um, I, so I want to ask some of the questions that have been coming in from our, um, our audience. And just to flag for you all that you have probably another couple of minutes to add your questions. And you can also vote for questions from others. Um, and those are the ones I'll spot first. So it's worth doing that. Um, but the question I have, um, and then I want to bring in our colleagues from the first panel, and because there are very many technical questions that we're going to hazard. Um, but before we do that, a question perhaps for Dr. Malik, although for all of our current panelists, um, Stacey Gilbert asks, recently, Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health did a webinar looking at why COVID doesn't seem to be transmitting in humanitarian contexts as we originally predicted. So why, hasn't it seemed to result in high mortality in refugee camps and other humanitarian settings? Um, can the model, can any of you suggest or shed light on this mystery? Yeah, thank you. Let me just come in. I think we are just lucky how, why the Africa in general, not necessarily only the conflict affected countries, we have seen a low mortality and morbidity. There are many school of thoughts but yes, when we are talking about the impact, we need to really see how it has not been uh, so impactful in those areas where initially it was apprehended that we will see large number of deaths and also more cases in those settings. Uh, it is possible. One of the beauty of this model is that that looks into the sub-national level in a specific geographic areas. So we need to maybe broaden the scope of the data collections, not necessarily only on susceptibility, vulnerability profile, but their behavioral issues and some other nature or habits that might be in, of interest to all of us to see why it has not had a devastating impact in those settings, as opposed to what we apprehended at the very beginning. In Africa general, there has been no high number of cases and deaths, but that's another uh, set of discussion. But in order to understand why it did not have that devastating impact, I believe we need to broaden the scope of data collection, meaning different types of data set needs to be collected rather than on the uh, typical or the type of data that we are currently collecting for feeding into this model. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Malik, that's very helpful. And I, I wanted to bring in our colleagues from the first panel without further ado, because there are very many questions for you. Um, and as we do that, um, I will just uh, read for you the question that's currently the most voted one, um, which is from Louis Lillywhite, who says, you sound as though you're using from da data from North America and Europe as an input into your model, but data from Africa suggests that the disease in Africa has different characteristics. Does this undermine the validity of your model? So sort of picking up on the previous question, who would like to, to pick up on that question and will any of you may answer? So I'll start it and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Matt since I think Matt has a, a, a good handle on the parameters that are being used. Um, I, it's, it's a great question. And uh, you know, certainly I, I think something for us to you know, be thinking about as far as the parameters that are being used, it's important to realize that the, that the parameters that, that we are using are coming from kind of the global literature here um, so these are these are best estimates based off of uh, you know what the U.S. CDC gives us as parameters, and uh, you know that is coming from data from really all over the world. Um, you know it is uh, I, I, you know, to to the to the core of the question. You know I I think that it is it is certainly possible that the disease parameters are different in in certain areas uh, of the world than others. But I don't think we have enough information on that to, to know for certain. So we're using the best information possible uh, from the parameters that we are given. And we can adjust for those parameters if we, if we need to, if, if you know, more evidence comes in. Um, but for now, you know, just using that global set. Uh, Matt, I'll let you go ahead and speak to that in detail. Uh, yeah, so I think the answer to this is actually, there's a number of answers to this. Um, so first is what Jason alluded to. Uh, a lot of these parameters are based off meta-analyses that include data from kind of around the world. Um, now, the question is, is that global mean kind of appropriate in this context? Um, 
So I would say for the one, the parameters that we're using from the CDC, the answer is mostly yes. Uh, so we're mostly dealing with parameters here that are related to the disease progression. So it's things like incubation time and things that we think are relatively intrinsic to the virus itself and not so much dependent on, you know, local dynamics. Uh, when it comes to things that are very local, like, um, like for example, r not or the doubling time, things like that, we more or less estimate them from the data, uh, the historical data. So we're really trying to avoid making hard assumptions and then transferring them into completely different contexts. But I mean, it's like Jason said, it's, there's only so much we can do. There's a lot of uncertainty on a lot of these parameters. And you know, that's reflected in the confidence intervals we use for them. But that's, that's all I can that's, that's great, thank you. And would anyone else like to pick on that up on that before we move on? All right, so um, I want to move just back to something we discussed briefly earlier, um, but this concept of this model as a, um, a public good that we is there for all of us to pick up and use as we need to. Um, and again, to any of you um, who'd like to tell us a little bit more about um, how, 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 how do you think about announcing or making a digital public good? Um, is there some kind of registration process? Um, and, um, and then just specifically to this model, um, can it be customized for specific countries and even at the subnational level, perhaps if someone could pick that, that question up as well. And we have about five minutes left, um, but it would be great to get one more question in before then. So please keep your answers brief. Thank you. So I think, I think I'll take this one. So it's Shelby here again, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And so I think that we view it very much so as, as a public good in the sense that I, I, in the spirit of collaboration, in the spirit of science, that we want it to be um, open source. We want uh, everyone to have the opportunity to get their hands on it and to ask the questions and do so. Um, within the documentation that is that is available, which I saw go up in the chat, there is lots of information about how to adjust the parameters into the model, I would say, um, and what are easily adjustable and, 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 um, and within the context of the model and its current structure. But also, if there are questions about the, the structure of the model, um, please feel free to send them to us and we will answer them as, as best as we can. Um, it is modifiable to uh, different countries. For instance, the input to the model is actually a, sh a shape file, as we call it, that includes the regions of a country and the number of cases per region. Um, and we estimate uh, our model, how we initialize the, the model is from case counts in a region, you know, and, and with a few other things like mobility. So it is absolutely portable to other contexts outside of those that, that have been given to you as examples today. Um, and we very much so encourage people to do so. And if you need support in that, then we have an uh, email address, which um, I will, I believe it is buckymodel at jhuapl.edu that um, if there are technical questions, they can be directed there. They can also be directed toward to um, the Center for Humanitarian Data and Leonardo, and, and, but it is definitely there. And we encourage um, people to use this in whatever context that, that they find it useful and operational. I, ju just one word to say that the framework that we are releasing today, the model is completely customizable. So if anyone is interested in extending the model to a given context, they are able to set all the parameters and the population and also the fraction of the vulnerable of the, pop of the population considered vulnerable and so on. At the same time, we're also releasing the, all the data that we have used to parameterize the model in uh, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, and uh, Iraq and, uh, and DRC. So we're releasing the parameterization and a model that is completely customizable together with training materials on, you know, on how to use the model. Fantastic. And perhaps if I could pop in with another question that's come up quite a bit in the Q&A, which is, um, I'm boiling down many questions, so forgive me for paraphrasing, but um, as, the, as you learn more, as we all learn more as the model is used, as others suggest changes, what is the uh, iteration cadence that you're planning? Are you, what's the feedback mechanisms that you are planning to use to update the model and to refine it based on what we, what we learn as we go forward? 
I, I think I can speak to this briefly. Um, so yeah, I also saw a lot of questions related to kind of broadly validation. Um, so we've been using this model in one form or another since I would say about March in various other contexts. Um, and it is, it's really just been constantly iterated on the entire time. Um, with respect to the validation, uh, we're consistently going back and doing historical runs to check and make sure we're not breaking things. Um, and you know whether our improvements are actually giving us the performance that we expect. Um, most of our, the one thing I would point out is most of our very rigorous validation is happening in a US context, but we expect that a lot of it is generally pretty transferable. Uh, we're in the process of doing more rigorous validation in these humanitarian aid countries, but um, it, there I'd say we've done kind of the medium validation. That's great, thank you. Well, I hope that we get to learn a lot more of uh, learning about the learning as you go forward. Um, because as for all of us who are working on this, I think learning tr together is very important. Um, we are out of time. So it remains for me to thank all of the panelists very much for joining us and for sharing their time and expertise. Also to our opening speakers and to all of you, the attendees who are contributing such fantastic questions and who are part of the Ocho um, community. So it, I have to now hand over with the great thanks to Sarah Telford, who's the lead at the Centre for Humanitarian Data to take us home. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Um, thank you so much, Laura. And I'm so glad your, your technical issues got resolved. It was so nice to have you moderate. And thank you so much for, for agreeing. Um, I'm just full of thanks. I mean, thank you to the field colleagues, Dr. Malik, uh, Pabalo for joining. Uh, thank you to the Johns Hopkins team. It's been an amazing collaboration. We've learned so much and we hope that it can continue. My team as well. Uh, thank you to all the hard work and our partners. I mean, the Rockefeller Foundation, just to pick up on what Evan said in his opening remarks, the speed of this is really unprecedented, you know, to try and get something up and running and uh, get it to be useful. Uh, it's, it's something we've never done before. So we're learning, but the demands are, are there to do these things much more quickly and to have this standing capacity now within the center and to have these amazing uh, academic partners. I think it's a really great model for modeling, so to speak. So we're excited about that. We're also incredibly uh, grateful for our, our, our donors. So obviously we're based here in the Netherlands. We love our hosts, the, the host. Uh, here in The Hague, um, so the, the government of the Netherlands, uh, the UK, Belgium, uh, Germany, um, and of course I mentioned the Rockefeller Foundation. So thank you so much and for all of you joining and who remained on, uh, well done. And we will be sharing a recording. If you have any questions, you can go to our website, center.humdata.org. Uh, we will be sharing a recording of this soon. And so you can please share it with others. And you know, just to, to reiterate what, what Leonardo said, we are looking for collaborators uh, for peer review. If you want to uh, join our reviewer pool, um, if you want to volunteer and do some coding with us, please be in touch. So thank you to everyone and good night. We'll talk again soon. <laughs>